Greetings to all of you. I want to welcome all of us at uh, Center Street Church, those of us uh, here at Center Campus, as well as those joining us from our campus in Northwest Calgary, Bridgeland, Airdrie, and South Calgary. also want to welcome our online audience as well. You know, in the last few years, we've had a fresh sermon series for the summer. But this year, we are not starting a new series. Instead, we're going to continue our study on the book of 1 John. And our hope is that by the end of August, we will finish preaching through this uh, great book of the Bible. As you read uh, John's writings, you will see one of John's dominant themes is love. The Apostle Paul can be called the Apostle of Faith. Peter is the Apostle of Hope. James is the apostle of good works, and John is the apostle of love. John repeatedly comes back to this uh, topic of love in all his writings. In fact, the word love appears 46 times in this first letter of John, and it is interwoven all the way from the beginning to the end of the letter. And let me tell you, love is the central theme of the Bible. And no matter how many sermons you preach, you cannot exhaust this grand theme of God's love. And today's message can be summarized in a single sentence. In fact, in three words, God loves me. And that is my prayer for every single person here in this place, that you would leave today with the assurance in your heart that you're deeply loved by God. Now, this message may seem simple, especially if you were raised in the church. You've heard this so many times that you may think this is redundant. And I tell you, the more people I engage with, I find that this is an all-too-common struggle, our inability to personalize God's love and allow it to shape our identity. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Imagine God thinking about you. What do you assume God feels when you come to mind? Well, you can open your eyes now, and I want you to be totally honest here. What was the very first thing that came to your mind? You can ask the same question to Christians or non-Christians, and you will get a range of responses. And some people think, some of you here think, God is angry at you because all He sees is your sins and failures. For some, God is disappointed because they feel like they have let Him down. Others see God ignoring them because they are not that important. Our life experiences can deeply impact our view of God. And so many of us allow these experiences to distort our image of God. But regardless of what you assume God's thoughts are towards you, the Bible tells us that when God thinks of you, His heart overflows with love. Love that is unconditional, unchanging, consistent, deep, that flows from His Father heart. We are beloved children of God. And if this truth were to become the core of our identity, then it will change the way we see ourselves, and it will give us a capacity to love like we've never had before. I'm going to ask us to stand right now as we read our text for today from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, 
God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. Lord, we ask that you will shine your light upon your word, <coughs> that every person here will see your loving heart. We pray that by the power of your spirit, you will remove any distorted images of God that we have accumulated because of our life experiences. But help us to see you as you are. And we pray that as we receive this truth, it will have a powerful impact upon our lives. So we give this time, Lord, into your hands. Minister today in the power of your spirit. For we ask this in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. In his famous book, The Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer wrote these famous words. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now, why is this statement so profound? Now, whether we recognize this or not, our conception of God can have a deep shaping influence on our lives. If our understanding of God is distorted, then we start off our Christian lives on the wrong foundation. In our text that we read in 1 John chapter 4, we find this incredible truth that describes the heart of God's character. Now, using a very simple phrase, the Apostle John gives us the image of the Christian God that is so different from any other religion or worldview. God is love. Our culture often reverses this and says love is God, and that is a false statement. You can say grass is green, but green is not grass. In the same way, God is love, but love is not God. But just as light radiates from the sun, in the same way, love radiates from the nature of God. And did you notice that the text didn't just say God is loving? If God was just loving, that would be just another attribute or quality of God. But it says God is love. God has many attributes like mercy, grace, justice, faithfulness. But the Bible never mentions God is grace or God is mercy. But it says clearly here in our text, God is love. Because love is at the very core of his being. Everything that God does is an extension of his love. He created the universe in love. He sustains and provides for his world that he created in love. Even his judgment is an expression of his love. There is nothing that God does that doesn't emanate from his loving nature. And take note of this. Any view of God that fails to acknowledge the centrality of His love is deficient, and it fails to live up to the description of God in the Bible. God is love. Love is not something God does, but it is who He is. It captures the nature and essence of who God is. Now, when we as humans love somebody, it is because we like something in that person. God's love doesn't work like that. He doesn't love us because we are lovable, but He loves us because that is His nature. It's so important that we grasp this. For our human love is so often performance-based. And somehow this has been ingrained into our minds. That is the world we live in. So much of our love is based on our conduct, and it is conditional. It really doesn't matter what kind of household you grew up in. Before you even learn to speak a word, you learn that acceptance hinges on your behavior. When kids do something right, it is affirmed. When they do something wrong, they find out right away. You do well in school, you are praised. When you're good at sports, you receive the applause. When you look beautiful, your photos receive many comments on Facebook. 
you excel in your work, you receive promotion. See, because this is so deeply in our subconscious minds, that this is how life works, we bring the same understanding into our relationship with God. If you have been in church even for a month, you will know this in your head that God loves you. We say this over and over. But when it comes to God's love, head knowledge alone is not enough. Nowhere is there a big gap between the head and the heart like when it comes to understanding and comprehending the love of God. We may say out loud, God loves the world. We may even say, God loves me. But subconsciously, so many of us try to earn God's love through our religious performance. We think, if I come to church, if I read my Bible, give my money, volunteer my time, keep my sins to a minimum, then God will love me more. And when you fail, when you stumble, you think God looks at you with disappointment. Somehow we think our actions determine whether God is going to love us or not. Today, I want every one of you here to know God loves you not because we deserve His love, but because He is love. It has nothing to do with you, but it has everything to do with who He is. So look at what the Apostle John says here in our text in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Every one of us will agree that love is beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful of all virtues. Where did love come from? John says that love originates in God. And that is why we as human beings, even those who are non-Christians, can express love because we are made in God's image. On a side note, this is yet another confirmation that we serve a triune God. If God was just one in person, then how did He exercise love before He created the world? Was He just a narcissist in love with Himself? In order to extend love, you need another person. And the Christian understanding of one God who exists in three persons tells us that perfect love is shared within a sacred community of three. The triune God has always existed in loving relationship, and He ch chose to extend the circle of love. And that is why He created this world. He created you and me so we can share in this love. Now, when we talk about this uh, love that originates in God, it feels like an abstract, ethereal concept. God's love is not just an abstract, mystical feeling. This is very practical and real. And John tells us that God's love was clearly expressed not through words, but through a person, the Lord Jesus. Well, when I share my faith with uh, someone from another religion, I often ask this question, according to your beliefs, tell me, how do you know God loves you? And I seldom receive any definitive answers because there are no answers in other worldviews. God's love is just a mental concept. At the most, they can come up with subjective answers like, I know God loves me because He has blessed me with a good life. But as Christians, we can say this with utmost confidence. This is how I know God loves me. He entered into this world to forgive me and make me as part of His family. So that's exactly what John says here in our text in verse 9. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. It's only in the Christian faith God's love is not just a mental concept, 
but it was expressed, made visible through the incarnation of Christ. In Christ, love came down from heaven to earth. This is sacrificial love. This is love in action, not just words or sentiments. A few years ago in Los Angeles, a metro train had an accident that killed several individuals and injured many. As the rescue work began, firefighters and rescue team members worked for hours with the hope of finding some survivors. Someone indicated that there was a man trapped under the debris. Using the jaws of life, rescuers were able to extricate a man named John from the wreckage. He was injured, but still alive. And at the time, the lead firefighter noticed something that moved him to tears, and it made the news. While John was just pinned under a train seat and other debris from the crash, he wrote a message to his wife and children using his own blood. With whatever energy he could summon and a heartbreaking economy of words, he wrote a farewell note in, the, in blood on the seat of the train. I love my kids. I love Leslie. The blood ink seemed to be running out as he got to the second sentence. Now, if John's wife and kids needed to know how much he loved them, they didn't need any more evidence than his writing in blood. One look at those words inscribed on the train seat, they would know without a shadow of a doubt how precious they were to him and how much he loved them. That even at the time of his death, they were the ones foremost in his mind. John's blood spoke volumes of his deep love and affection for his family. And oh, in a similar way, 2,000 years ago, on a hill called Calvary, God also communicated his passionate love for the world through the blood of his son. When Jesus willingly bore the cross for your sins and mine and shed his precious blood, God revealed his deep love for each one of us. Every drop of Jesus' blood has your name and my name written on it. And Jesus did all this so that through his death we might live. And that is why all our talks about God has to be filtered through the cross. All our views of God must refract there. This is where it all converges. So John writes in verse 10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love of the highest kind. You will not find a greater display of love than this. The cross is the lens that we use to see the true character of God. A person who doesn't understand the cross has no idea of God's love. The cross gives a new definition to the word love. As John says, we did not love God. He first loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice for our sins. God is presented here as the one who initiates his love towards us and pursues us until we surrender to his love. God's love for us precedes our love for God. Our love merely follows. It is a response. In the ancient world, it was thought appropriate to love only those who are worthy of your love. God's love is different, and we need to understand this. God loves us even though we are not worthy of his love. D.A. Carson gives a helpful illustration here that helps us to understand this concept. I mean, imagine a young man and a woman holding their hands and going for a walk. The young man stops all of a sudden, looks at the lady in the eye and 
he says, Susan, I love you. I really do. And what does he mean by that? Usually means he's just transfixed by her. He's attracted to her. Her smile, her beauty, her speech, her eyes, her hair, everything about her excites this young man. What he most certainly does not mean is this. Susan, your nose is like a cartoon character. Your hair is so greasy that I could lubricate an 18-wheeler with it. <laughs> your knees are so disjointed that you make a camel look elegant. <laughs> and your personality makes Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan look like wimps. But in spite of all of that, I want you to know, Susan, I love you. For sure, that's not what he means, right? Now, apply this to God's love. When God says, I love you, to us, is it because he's just transfixed by our physical beauty, our moral excellence, our sweet nature, our kind disposition? Is that why God says, I just can't help it, I'm falling in love with you? No, no, for we were dead in our transgressions and sins. There was nothing attractive about us. The Bible tells us that even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags in the sight of God. So when God says, I love you to you and me, it means that, morally speaking, we are the ones with a nose like a cartoon character, hair that is greasy, knees that are uglier than camels and personalities that would make Genghis Khan a saint. And yet, God loves you and me? How is this possible? It's possible because this is not a love based on feelings and emotions, but it originates from God's will that God, because of his nature and character, willingly chooses to love us even though we don't deserve the slightest bit. This is love. For think about this. We were not begging and pleading God to rescue us from our sins. We were not beseeching him for salvation, asking him to come down from heaven. No, we, unaware of our plight, were content in going our own way. We were indulging in selfish pleasures. We had turned our backs totally on God. And even when we were still hostile to him, that when we were enemies of God, while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us to pay for our sins and to demonstrate the full extent of his love. What that means is God's love for you does not hinge on your performance or your actions. He cherishes you now, not some future, better-looking version of you. Hear this, church. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. And there is nothing that you can do to make him love you less. His love is not conditioned by your behavior. And sometimes, pitifully, when we try to earn God's love, it's like my kids trying hard to earn my love by being good. And if my kids come to me and say, Daddy, we have done all our chores. We have behaved so well all day. And if there's anything else that we can do for you today, we will do it cheerfully. By the way, it doesn't ever happen in our home, not even close. <laughs> I'm just speaking hypothetically here. But if my kids were to behave there, best so they can earn my love. That would actually sadden my heart because I would assume that I've been a terrible parent to communicate something like that to my children. My love for them is not conditioned by their performance. Now, how much more true this is of God's love. We don't need to perform and earn God's love. We receive it as a free gift. See, I'm passionate about this truth for the simple reason 
that this is an area I often struggle. Call it my spiritual weakness. Now, if I can be vulnerable and confess to you today, it may be my upbringing or my personality, the way I am wired. I can default into doing things for God in order to earn His approval. Now, I can easily buy into this lie that if I'm busy in the ministry, preaching sermons, sharing the gospel with non-Christians, counseling people, and feel the rush of all these activities, then I am close to God and He smiles at me. That when I take a day off or go on a vacation or skip my quiet time one day, that God has a frown on His face. And I need to remind myself over and over, my value in the eyes of God is not based on my productivity. And I have to keep claiming this promise so I don't succumb to the lie of trying to maintain my relationship with God by my actions. And every time I speak, I have to remember if this is the last sermon I ever preach and I'm laid low for the rest of my life, it will not change the fact that I'm a beloved child of God and He loves me so much. That is true of every one of us here. God loves you when you feel you're obedient, disciplined, you're reading your Bible, faithful in coming to church. And He loves you the same when you're irritable, selfish, and when you stumble in sin. We don't have to win God's heart. His heart is already in favorable disposition towards us. So our love for God and our obedience is merely a response to God's love because we are loved unconditionally by a great God. We are called to walk in obedience because we are cherished by God so much. We demonstrate His love that flows freely from our hearts to touch others. The motivation here is not earning acceptance, but the motivation is gratitude. That is the primary exhortation of our text. Our love for others springs from God's love for us. So John writes in verses 7 and 8, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And when we become Christians, we have a new capacity to love. Because you have tasted the love of God and experienced His love in your heart, you are able to pass the same love to others. If God is love, how can we who claim to be part of God's family not have the family resemblance? God's love is transformative. You cannot remain unchanged when you genuinely experience His love in your life. When you're impacted by the torrential outpouring of God's love, you become a channel for His love to flow through you. And if you are unable to love others, John will say to us, it is because you have not experienced the one who is love. You need a greater measure of healing in your heart. Come, dip yourself in the fountain of God's love, for surely you will be healed on the inside. And the proof of your healing will be seen in your ability to sh show that same love to others. So John writes in here in verses 11 and 12 as we bring this to a close. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. What John is saying here is very powerful. God is spirit. He cannot be physically seen. In fact, no human being can possibly see God in all His glory and live. But when Christians exercise love, we help the world around us see God and encounter the invisible God who lives in us. The unseen God who revealed His love by sending His Son 2,000 years ago continues to reveal His love today through you and me, His followers. I love Christian apologetics, and I believe that we need to offer good intellectual reasons for the hope that we have in Christ. But I also know this very well, that it is not just our ability to reason that makes us good witnesses. Love is the strongest apologetic for the gospel. And if we want to see people come to faith in Christ in our day and age, we need a revolution of love in the church. But when we demonstrate love, we make God's love visible to those who live around us. I'm going to ask us to stand right now as we come to an end. In a few moments from now, we're going to repeat the same exercise that we did at the beginning of this message. Imagine God thinking about you. What do you assume God feels when you come to His mind? And if some of you here, the very first thing that came to your mind when you did that exercise was some kind of a negative emotion. But today, through the Scripture, you have seen the character of God. You understood the depth of His love that you cannot understand the character of God without the lens of the cross. Now, would you allow all those distorted images that you have accumulated to be put aside today and allow this truth to become a revelation? A revelation is when truth comes alive in a person's life. God is love. This is love. Not that we loved God, but He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Would you close your eyes right now? When God thinks about you, what's the very first thing that comes to His mind? Now, I know the Spirit of God wants to speak to every person here. and write a new message in your heart. That this truth, as you personalize this into your life, will have a profound impact on how you live for the rest of your life. So let's maintain a moment of silence and allow the Holy Spirit of God to be alive in this place and do a deep work in each of our hearts. After that, I'll close this in prayer. Lord, in the quietness of this moment, we open our hearts to your love. I pray that you would make your love come alive in every heart here. Behold what manner of love you have lavished on us that we can be called children of God. And that is who we are. pray that you will replace any false, distorted image that we have stored up and that you will help the eyes of our heart to see who you are, the boundless, 
mercy and love of God. And as we receive this into the very core of our being, I pray, God, that each of us will have our identity rooted in this, that we are loved and we are precious in your sight. I pray for all of us here as we receive this fresh outpouring of your love, that this love will spill over and touch the hearts of our family members, especially the ones who are close to us, that we will be able to share this love, that those our paths will intersect, that even they will come to experience this invisible love of God, and it will be made visible in their hearts and in their lives. And even as we leave this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the sweet, unfailing fellowship of the Holy Spirit may rest and abide with each and every one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. If you have a prayer concern, I want to encourage you to come forward. There will be prayer partners here. God bless you.